A lot of people get excited about the flexibility in Kanban and its first principle of start with what you do now. So people slap together a board and use it while keeping everything around their work the same. They ignore all the rest in the Kanban method, which is about managing the work, preserving the flow and evolving the system. However, if we are truly talking about managing work and initiatives in organizations in an effective way, we must introduce Kanban in a more useful way than boards and post-its. And the best way for that is by using STATIC. STATIC is an acronym for the System Thinking Approach to Introducing Kanban. It offers six steps and has a pre and a post condition that when followed through can guarantee that your Kanban will introduce systemic improvement in your organization. STATIC is a way to take a holistic look at your current system of work and investigate what could make it better. Why is that important? Because it encourages a global, a broad perspective global optimizations rather than just local fixes, ensuring that the improvements are both effective and sustainable. How does it do that? Static tells you to first start with the end in mind. As you go through this video, I encourage you to picture your reality. Pick your team, your department process, for example, and start following along considering the static steps as I describe them to you. The precondition, understand the purpose of the system as a customer. Before diving into creating boards, it is crucial to have a conversation or conversations to ensure that everyone understands what fit for purpose means for your system, whether this is your department or the whole product making organization. And this involves discussing the why behind your work. Ask What's the primary function of your team or your organization? Who really benefits from your work? What is the purpose behind your efforts? Clarifying these points establishes a baseline for value. From this point on, value is no longer a fluffy word floating in the sky that you can barely understand. This step is essential, even for temporary projects or teams or even task forces. And from here on, I'll refer to the team, department, and their work collectively as the system. Step one is understanding the sources of the satisfactions with the current state. Now that you've established what the system should deliver and why, it's time to delve into understanding its performance. Ask the questions about what's been working and what hasn't. And this step involves a thorough investigation of dissatisfaction sources, both internally and externally. Internally, it could be factors like feeling overwhelmed or compromising the quality due to tight deadlines. Externally, it could be issues like erected uh, deliveries or subpar quality from the client's perspective. You are trying to answer questions here like, what are the main pain points or challenges we encounter in your current software development process? Um, how do these challenges impact the quality and timelines of the deliverables? To pinpoint these sources, you should survey both customers and the team members formally and informally, compiling feedback for analysis. Please do not guess, investigate. Understanding these dissatisfaction elements sets the stage for designing a work management system that proactively addresses the concerns that you saw and will set realistic expectations. And most importantly, we talk a lot about improvement in agility, don't we? But improvement can't happen everywhere all the time. So this investigation will tell you where it hurts the most objectively, which is another way of saying this is where you should start your system improvement. The step two is to analyze the work demand. Okay, so now that you understand your purpose and the areas for improvement, let's analyze the work demand. Ask yourself, where does the work come from? Go deeper. It's internally from other departments or is directly requested by customers or is it by third parties? What is the rate of arrival of work? Is it daily, hourly, sporadic? It has random peaks. What are the expectations surrounding the requests? 
consider quality, consider speed of fulfillment. This helps you define your work items and their workload. For instance, a support team may have varied requests from, you know, with different time and quality expectations. Remember, at this stage, you were discovering, you're not making any decisions. Step three is to analyze the current delivery capability. So let's dive into analyzing your current delivery capability. It's time to look inside and have some fun, I hope. Access all the historical data that you have from dashboards or ticketing systems for insights into key performance metrics. And they will be delivery time, predictability, and are you meeting the expectations? It could be customer ratings. Ask yourself, how long does it take to deliver work on average? How consistent are the delivery times? What's the gap between the expectations and the current capability? This analysis will help you identify the strength and the areas for improvement in your delivery process. Understanding these metrics is what helps set realistic goals and align the team capabilities with the customer expectations. And now finally, with this understanding, you are ready to craft your Kanban board. And that's step four, model the current system workflow. This is where you're going to examine the current steps you take to complete work. Identify all the major tasks, categories, and phases. It's similar to a value stream mapping process if you're familiar with that, but it's on a smaller scale with your team and your departments. Notice I said current. Don't decide to add or remove steps yet. Understand how you currently deliver value to your customers, including both value add and non value add activities. Keep all the steps in your visualization, even if you think they are irrelevant. If you think that having a step dedicated to project manager approval is irrelevant, well, but you currently do that, keep that step in. Another thing is to focus on activities on your workflow, but not who performs them. For instance, if only Tammy can do performance testing, include that step in your workflow, but don't include Tammy. Now, since it's only Tammy, I'm assuming you will run into bottlenecks eventually, but constraints like bottlenecks and the likes will be addressed later. For now, this is just information. Step five is to identify your classes of service. From this point on, things start to get a little bit different than what most departments and teams do out there. Most people in teams and in departments will have their own priority systems like P1, P2, P3, or urgent, normal, etc. They are not always useful though. It's not uncommon that something becomes urgent because Dave, the senior VP, screamed the loudest. In Kanban, we want to look at priority under a more scientific light by using cost of delay. While I won't explain this in detail in this video, we are literally talking about opportunity cost and real levels of risk. Dave screams while frightening, they do not constitute a high opportunity cost. The usual Kanban classes of services you're going to find are expedite for work items with critical priority and a very high cost of delay. This is literally the company is losing money type of request, which means that realistically, very few items should be placed here. Then you have fixed delivery date for the assignments which have a fixed date in the high cost of failing to deliver on time. A fixed date is not a due date that our fictitious Dave gave us. It is a real date. For example, if you miss the opportunity to appear on a trade show, or if it's a season like Black Friday, or a law that has a limited timeline to be adopted, that is fixed date. Then you're going to have standard for almost everyday work items with a moderate cost of delay. A lot of your work will likely fall into this category and they are probably executed in order of arrival and you can play with the priorities freely in there. An intangible is for assignments with little to no cost of delay, kind of like your nice to have. 
And then now is the final step, define your Kanban system. This final step is about creating your pull system, the system that streamlines your workflow, allowing for a much faster and more reliable response to the demand. What it's going to do once you follow the practices and the principles of Kanban is that you're going to prevent overloading team members by showing the work visually, by limiting ongoing tasks and tracking their completion times. As tasks are completed, then new ones are introduced based on available capacity. The aim is to efficiently move tasks from ready to done. Essentially, you get stuff done effectively. You will introduce whip limits, you will make your policies explicit, yada, yada, yada. Hey, wait a minute, this sounds a lot like what I explained in the other video precisely. So check that video to have a clear picture of the practices you would start using as you put your Kanban into practice. And then there is a post condition, socialize and negotiate expectations. Your work doesn't exist in a vacuum, so you should be talking to people during this process of static. Probably your teams and many stakeholders took part in the work sessions that you hosted while you were designing your Kanban system, I really hope. But even if they did not, what follows now is educating everybody on the nature of how you are working and why, and monitoring and proactively managing your work so start noticing the effects of this new system. Are you communicating what's happening within your work better? What changes are you observing on quality, on speed? Are your customers more satisfied? Collect observations from everybody. And it's advised to hold workshops, I would say, with different teams from dependent services to synchronize the work processes, let's say of multiple Kanban systems. Now, Kanban may sometimes be perceived as this cop-out to Scrum or an easy way out to agility. Other people just wonder, why Kanban? Why should I use it? When should I use it? And that is what this next video is all about. If, however, you're right now more curious about how to get started with the important conversations for socialize and negotiate your Kanban, then you wanna watch this video right here.